Hi everyone, it's John. Nice to see you again, uh, in a timely manner, like I promised. I told you I would be back on a more regular basis, and lo and behold, it's been exactly seven days, so um, I arranged it that way. I have a book review for you today, with a little bit of a preamble about the uh, company that sent it to me and the author that wrote it. First of all, let me just show you the book. Uh, this is, uh, depending on how much you want to anglicize his name, uh, Jacques Necker, or Jacques Necker, on executive power in the great states. And this edition was just put out uh, this year, I believe, January, or s January 2021. This is edited uh, with an introduction by Aurelien Crescu who is a professor uh, of political science at the University of, of Indiana at Bloomington, I believe. He is a, he's a Necker expert and uh, sort of a, uh, does extensive work with 18th century French political theory and thought. Uh, like I said, in full disclosure, uh, this book was sent to me by Liberty Fund after I uh, begged them for a copy uh, in return for a uh, honest uh, and full review, which I'm going to provide them with. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about Nick Air first, since he's almost certainly not known to most people watching this video. I had certainly never heard of him before. Jacques Necker was born in 1732, died in 1804, and he was a Swiss statesman and banker, and he was appointed by King Louis XVI to be the director of the royal treasury and the director of the royal finances. Through his position as a banker, he amassed a very large fortune by the age of 40 and partially because of his tremendous success in the banking world. In 1776, he was appointed as the uh, Directeur du Tresor Royal, which is an achievement almost unheard of, as Necker was from uh, a Genevan Protestant family. And at the time, Catholicism, of course, was the official state religion of France. In 1781, he made the highly controversial decision to doesn't seem controversial these days, but at the time it was, it was, it was quite something. He made the decision in, 18, in 1781 to make the royal budget a public document. It was no longer, uh, no more spending money behind closed doors. It was, it was a matter of official public record. What was being spent by the king and on what. Uh, like a, a document before that had been completely shrouded. In secrecy. And for this brazen act, uh, since he had some sort of, you know, independence, uh, he was summarily dismissed by the king, uh, as he would be again a couple of other times during his, his tenure under the king. But he was recalled to his position, which is probably a testament as to how smart and useful and valuable he was in the, in the king's administration. As if his public life wasn't fascinating enough, Necker was married to the brilliant Salonnière Suzanne Chocot, uh, whose talents for mathematics and science were profound. During the time she spent in Paris while Necker worked for Louis XVI, Suzanne's intellectual circle included the esteemed names of the Comte de Buffon, Edward Gibbon, to whom she was actually briefly engaged before she married her husband, Denis Diderot and Jean d'Alembert. Uh, Jacques and Suzanne had a daughter named Germain, uh, Germain de Stal, actually, whose opposition to Napoleon would later be so virulent that she had to go into exile to escape his wrath. So not only is... Uh, Necker, uh, sort of a, a looming figure in 
in the financial economic history of late 18th century France. He's also married to a woman who is quite the impressive, like I said, Solonier, which is um, a, a woman in charge of these sort of small intellectual circles that they, they would meet in public cafes and private houses and talk about philosophy and the arts and science and literature. And they get together and they have Germain de Stahl. <laughs> so it's, it's quite a family. Uh, but on to the book itself. As Aurelien Crechou explains in his introduction to Jacques Necker's uh, 1792 book, is, which is when this was originally published on executive power in the great states, uh, the author's name hasn't really come down to us, hasn't redounded with the force of, say, uh, an Alexis de Tocqueville or a Montesquieu or certainly a Voltaire. And this is probably because the latter three were in some ways radical, uh, had brash, new, innovative ideas, while Necker remains, in every sense of the word, a pretty thoroughgoing moderate. What does it mean to call him a moderate in the age of the French Revolution, which is... Uh, when he wrote this book, the very, very height of the French Revolution. First, he, was, he, he very much prided himself on grounding his thought in theoretical, real-world concerns and not giving himself up to the vagaries of things like metaphysics uh, or philosophy, words that he always uses with a bitter taste in his mouth. Uh, Necker is a monarchist. Um, he is embraces democracy, but does it very suspiciously. Um, uh, however, he's not a supporter of the Louis XIV, uh, Les Tatses Moi style absolutism. He's not a, he's not divine right of kings monarchist. He's just a, has, like, like many uh, um, well-educated, wealthy men of his time, um, and, by the way, many of the American founding fathers as well, um, some deep reservations about democracy. Um, whereas the uh, philosophes, the, uh, the French philosophers, uh, believed in what Necker thought was an irresponsible kind of total popular sovereignty. I'm talking about the, the more famous philosophers of, of the French Enlightenment, people like Rousseau, Voltaire, uh, Necker adopted a more nuanced position of, of sovereignty and of democracy, which still maintained structural hierarchies like the monarchy. The first half of Necker's book is a detailed critique of the French Constitution of 1791, the, which was the result of two years of debates in the National Constituent Assembly. National Constituent Assembly. Despite however much thought went into it, it remained for Necker a fundamentally flawed document because it saw to completely delegitimize executive power, which is to say the power of the king, basically. Uh, Necker's moderation recognized what he thought was the necessary role of executive power. As we've already seen, uh, Necker's solution would have been a, sort of a middle road solution, a moderate solution, to curb arbitrary dictates of the king, which he would have readily admitted was necessary, while at the same time imbuing his office with the power and ability that allows him to, detain, to retain his own decision-making power. Uh, this sort of echoes Montesquieu's uh, L'Esprit de Loi, uh, written about 40 years before uh, Necker wrote this book, uh, Necker advocated for a sophisticated mixture between the executive and the legislative powers, which we now know as separation of powers, a term that we get from Montesquieu, wherein the king exercises some legislative functions and citizens exer exercise some executive functions. The second half of the book is spent defending 
the principles of the U.S. Constitution and the English constitutional monarchy against that of the French Constitution. Necker's moderation was naturally drawn to American federalism with its balance of powers, which uh, divides powers, not only, not only separates powers, but divides them into national and regional governments, which is, of course, uh, called federalism. He also vastly preferred U.S. bicameralism compared to the unicameralism of the French, uh, French Constitution. Combined, he thought that these provided an adequate system of checks and balances that would lead to a successful government. While Necker may have had original arguments worth consideration, his political moderation combined with his eh, lackluster <laughs> prose style combined render him, at least thinking back about the book, something more of a sort of uh, an effectual, effective bureaucrat interested in the proper functioning of the government rather than a really riveting philosopher. Whatever the merits of Necker's political theory, his writing, or at least this translation, which by the way is the original 1792 translation into English, this uh, Liberty Fund edition was not retranslated, just with a new introduction by Aurelien Grachou. Uh, this translation leaves a lot to be desired. I think in many places it uh, has what could be argued to be significant amounts of purple prose, whether that's the translator's fault or Necker's, I can't really say. Uh, there's quite a bit of repetition of points from chapter to chapter and within chapters of the arguments, which can induce a good bit of sort of skimming and sighing, <laughs> Uh, to wit, uh, Necker has a peculiar disdain and condescending attitude towards philosophers, as I mentioned above, whose detachment from reality and practical problems, he thinks, very much mirrors that of the revolutionary governments at the time. Uh, he is constantly suspicious of philosophers and references them as, uh, like I said, metaphysicians, which he always sees as a pejorative. Uh, imagine bankers looking down their nose at philosophers. Uh, after more than two centuries, how much has changed and yet how much remains the same. So that's what I have to say about this book. It is an interesting little piece of late 18th century political economy, uh, political theory, by someone I had never heard of. I'm imagining probably most people may not have heard of him. But uh, this is available at the Liberty Fund if you uh, wish to uh, look into it. I will leave, as always, the uh, link to my original Goodreads review below, as well as a link to uh, the Liberty Fund site where you can uh, look at this. And, like I said last week, I will see you next week.